time this morning. Let me ask you to bow your heads as we join together in prayer. Father, we come so you can learn more about your church, about her ways, about how you've guided her through the years. Help us to know you better, to see the love of learning about you, about this world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, we come, this is week four, I suppose, of our uh, class in the Middle Ages. We're kind of covering, as I've mentioned so often, a kind of potpourri of, um, of history. Every week we cover something a little bit different. So I think next week we'll probably do a little bit of biography on Anthem, a little bit of discussion of the atonement. Uh, last week uh, we covered icons as an example of uh, kind of medieval controversy, a little bit about the Eastern Church there. Uh, we'll just kind of hit a lot of different topics because this is more a smattering uh, kind of getting you a little bit of knowledge and interest uh, in, in the area. We've come today to kind of two big big topics, big questions. Before we do, let me kind of do a little show and tell thing here for you. Um, this is a great series for kids. Uh, it says ages 9 to 14 or so, but a, a great little series that gives you kind of a, a history of the church. I don't know if we have any down downstairs in the library, but we, we might. If you uh, if we don't, then uh, go ahead and look at this one. And uh, feel free to ask me afterwards if you want to get, get, uh, get a copy or, or get the title series. But I commend that to y'all as a great little history book for uh, if you're looking to read through. Um, but anyway, this morning we come to, uh, to two major realities in the Middle Ages. If you ask people about the Middle Ages, they're going to tell you, and they're Christians, they're going to tell you probably at some point in time that in the Middle Ages there were these folks known as monks. I think most, most folks understand that monasteries were important, but I'm not sure we know necessarily what that actually means. When we did our, our series in the early church, we did a whole day on this. We did mostly focusing on kind of the Eastern hermits, the weird monks like St. Anthony. Remember St. Anthony? He put himself up on a big pole, a big stylite, and he went to the top and just stayed there and sat there and prayed there, and that showed his devotion. Uh, that's over in the East. The, the Western monks are a little different. Um, and so we come here just to give you a, a little bit of a sense of the, the history of the monastic orders, a little bit of a sense of why monks were so popular in the Middle Ages, and then we'll turn to uh, the question of knowledge and universities and medieval education. What did it mean to go to school in the Middle Ages? Well, if you're a girl, I'm so sorry, not much. Um, that's the way it was back in the day. Um, but before we get there, we come to the monks. We come to what it means to be in a monastic environment. Um, first and foremost here, we need to realize that whereas in the East, monks were individual, right? So in, in the Greek-speaking churches and areas, they tended to be uh, more of a hermit style. Not all, of course. The, look at the previous Sunday school last year to uh, get the details on that one. But in the West... To be a monk was to be much more communal. You live together with people. I remember when I went to seminary, uh, one of the seminaries, we had it was a big deal for some of the guys to kind of rent out an apartment building or rent out a house, and they lived together, like a frat house, but a Christian version, a, a, a seminary pastor version of a fraternity. It was uh, I was not involved in it. I didn't do it. Uh, it was too expensive for me. I didn't have the money to do it, but... I also didn't want to do it. It didn't really sound like the kind of thing that I, I was into. But it's what they were into in the West. They wanted to go uh, together and seek a higher spiritual life. The idea was if you were really serious about the Christian faith, you're going to dedicate yourself to live as a monk. You're going to dedicate yourself to separate yourself uh, from the general world you're going to tend to isolate yourself with those like you. And the first guy to do this, I think we may have mentioned him last year, Benedict. You have in your outline there, the name of Benedict, around 500 AD. He, he looks at Rome, he sees the depravity in Rome, he sees the awful things in Rome. So he, he goes into a cave, he, he looks to the, to the eastern guys, he looks to the Greeks, he says, okay, I, I guess what I have to do is go off into a cave and be a hermit. The problem is, uh, he gets too popular for that. People say, oh, wow, we have our new celebrity Christian. We have Benedict. Let's go see Benedict. 
He became a tourist attraction. Let's go see what, how Benedict's living. He's in a cave. That's weird. You know, when you go on a road trip and you're out in the Midwest, you see, you know, world's largest flunking cave. The kids want to go. And so you go there, right? You stop there. The largest ball of string, right? You, you, you want to stop there. Well, people wanted to stop and see Benedict. And so people want to join Benedict. And soon, a lot of people want to join him. And so what happens? He has to uh, set up a rule for how to live like Benedict, how to live the holy life. He changes Western monks forever. Prior to, the, prior to him, you take vows, but they're not perpetual. You take vows to follow somebody or vows to, follow, uh, to obey or to be uh, poor or to be chaste, but you don't do it your whole life just while you're there. You don't do it all your life. You, you know, you're there for a time. It's kind of like going on a gap year. You know, uh, it's kind of going, taking some time off and really getting in tune with yourself. What, what the CEOs do today in Silicon Valley, they go to India and they go, go on some sort of uh, trip to see the Dalai Lama. They take some time off, they take the vows, and they get back in their real life. That's the way it was before Benedict, but now it becomes a whole life. <coughs> with him, it becomes obedience all the time. Second, with Benedict, <coughs> Monks get punished. Beforehand, you wouldn't get punished for violating the laws, the rules of the local guy you're with. But after Benedict, well, there's an abbot in charge. There's the head honcho. There are rules. If you disobey, well, there's punishment involved. You have to repent. right? If you agree to this community living, if you want to have this high Christian lifestyle, well, you, you know, the Father disciplines those he loves. He might discipline you, too. In other words, it was very lax. Benedict comes in. And uh, he, he introduces the classic three categories of, uh, of vows. You have the vow of obedience. Obedience to Christ, but obedience to Christ in the person of the abbot, in the person of the guy who, who's, who's in charge. You have the vow of poverty. These are the classic three. You have the vow of chastity. Now, of course, if monks are taking the vow of chastity, that means that maybe not all priests were. Of course, there, there are many who were kind of the ordinary country parsons or whatnot, who, uh, who, who would not take that vow of chastity or poverty or obedience. Uh, but Benedict adds a couple of other things into the mix here. He says you also need to take a, a vow to submit to the whole community, not just the abbot, but the whole community. You need to take another vow. Stay here. Don't leave. Don't move. Don't go anywhere. You, you take a vow to stay here your whole life. So this is something that you would set aside everything for. You would give up all things, your mobility, your money, your ability to marry, take a different job. You would go here and you would dedicate yourself to the community. It was radical. It was a very ordered way of living. And it was actually, and one of the reasons why I bring it up, is if you look at the history of the medieval church, you look at the history of where did people begin to talk about reformation? Very often it's the monks. Very often, the, the monks are the ones who, they're trying to live this holy life. They do it for many years, but they find they can't always snuff out their sin, for example. Isn't that what happened to Luther? Wasn't Luther a monk? The answer is yes, of course he was. Many of those who sought reform in the church over the centuries came through the monasteries, came through those who thought seriously about what does it mean to have a holy life? Now, so by 100 years after Benedict, there are Benedictine monasteries all over Italy. By 850, that's 350 years afterwards, um, Charlemagne's, remember Charlemagne, the Franks, the only monastic rule in his lands is Benedict's rule. Everybody's a Benedictine. The early medieval church, everybody followed Benedict's rules. By the 12th century, they governed over 37,000 monasteries and over 20 popes came from the Benedictine order. Now, particularly in their community, they didn't just focus on farming. They didn't just focus on uh, self-sustaining lifestyles. They're, they're noted, and this is where kind of our, our popular view of monks comes from. The Benedictines are noted for focusing on copying manuscripts. One of the ways we have our Bible, one of the ways we have uh, so many sources from the uh, ancient world and from the medieval world is through the Benedictine monks. They copied manuscripts. I'm going to pass around this little book here. It has fun pictures. It feels nice in the front. 
uh, you can get a sense, a taste of uh, a little bit of the beauty of these things. When you think of manuscripts, you think of kind of boring, dull things. Quite lovely, quite colorful. Let me pass it around. Y'all feel free to look at it. Uh, if you get bored by me, you just take a look at that and you'll uh, be entertained for a little bit of time. <clears throat> so the Benedictine monks focus heavily on keeping the flame alive, keeping the tradition alive, keeping the Bible alive. Um, they're devoted to this monastic ideal. But of course, the problem is that this is a pretty heavy rule. It's a pretty heavy commitment. And not everybody wants to make that commitment. So over the years, you have kind of a development. You have uh, the emergence of what's called uh, mendicant monks. Mendicant monks, particularly by the, uh, the, the 1100s, the 1200s. You have the emergence of what's called mendicant monks. These are folks who, who uh, have no place to stay. They're, they're, they're homeless, in a sense. They, they, they don't have a, a building to go to. They don't have a monastery to go to. They're monks who live in the world. They're monks who travel. Isn't that what Christ did? Right? Christ had no place to lay his head. So really, don't you want to be like him? That's one of the arguments they used. The mendicant orders became known as, I think I have the word here, beghards. That was the guy version. Maybe you can tell the, the modern English word that we take from that. Beggar. The word beggar comes from this beghard. Those monks who had no place to stay, who had to live on other people's goodwill. The girl version was the, the Gaines. And they were focused on living in medieval towns. They're focused on living with the poor, living with the sick. The first real hospitals, the first real uh, kind of care for the sick came through monasteries like the Benedictines, but the first nurses, the first folks who really considered, how do I care? How do I take care? Beggars, Beguines, the folks who devote themselves to take care of the sick. Now, then you have the big two. You have the big two that emerge in the Middle Ages, the big two monastic orders that pop up here. And we're going to see uh, a kind of a, a rivalry emerge between these two. Later on, we're going to talk about St. Francis. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, Thomas Aquinas even today. But um, you have the two primary monastic orders. That's a third later on. The Jesuits will touch on them later towards the end. I think we'll have a class on the, <clears throat> the Inquisition in a little bit. We'll have a little discussion of that towards the end of our course. But you have the emergence to, in, in, in the, around uh, 1200, you also have the emergence of the Dominican order. There's a guy by the name of Dominic de Guzman. He's a Spanish guy, you can tell from the name. And uh, he, he becomes a missionary to the Muslims. He becomes a missionary to the Jews. He goes into Spanish territory. He tries to convert them. And then he goes back home to the Christian part of Spain. He tries to convert the Cathars. Cathars are kind of Gnostic heretics. He gets tired of that. So by 1214, he, he founds a monastery. 1216, he gets tired of that. And he gets papal approval from the Pope to lead the monastery and to travel and teach Administer the sacraments. Give absolution. What happens here with this guy, Dominic, is revolutionary. It is what you might call a revival movement. There's a little pathway between this guy and somebody like George Whitfield, Charles Finney. Similar kind of authority given here. The Dominicans are able to go around and preach. They're able to go around and give the sacraments. They're able to go around and absolve people of sin. They don't, you don't have to go to church. It's, it's in some ways revolutionary. It's only for the time period. And particularly the Dominicans saw their mindset was, look, the people are, are illiterate. Most folks in the Middle Ages, the, the, they don't know the Bible. They're not getting good preaching. They're not getting good teaching. We need to reform this. We need to change this. And so the Dominicans are known, if you want to think about them, they're known as the 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 itinerant preachers, the itinerant evangelists, those who go around and try to preach and teach true doctrine and, and theology. But of course, that doesn't last forever. As with any revival movement, it always gets part of an organization. It always builds an institution, you know. Um, they became part of the powerhouse academic establishment. 
And so they become known, the Dominicans, as the OP, the Order of Preachers. They become known as the Great Preachers. Peter Lombard was one, Albert the Great, Thomas Aquinas, Martin Butzer, Reformation, was a Dominican. Um, they become part of the Ivy League, if you will, of teaching. The other guys, their rivals, were the uh, Franciscans. Now, I always misspell Franciscan. I think I did it again. I did. That's okay. The Franciscans, the OFM, the Order of Friars Minor. The Order of Friars Minor, the OFM. <laughs> They're founded by St. Francis, 1209. St. Francis of Assisi. We'll get to his life maybe a couple of weeks on the road. He didn't want to found an order. He didn't want to make one. But just like Benedict, he got too popular. He became a celebrity. So he, he made one. He founded one. And generally, the Franciscans tended to focus a little bit less on teaching, at least in the beginning. They tended to focus more on what does it mean to live the Christian life. If you want to kind of have a division, they tend to be more pastoral. As a, as a, as a, that's the way we might use the term today. Than the Dominicans who focused on the teachings. You have these two, these two kind of orders, these two kind of uh, offshoots. Almost, you might even call them denominations. You wouldn't go that far, of course. Um, but that's, that's the way... Uh, they formed. And, the, and we have to look at uh, down the road, we'll see Dominicans and Franciscans, they come into uh, conflict, uh, theological issues, question of faith and works, that sort of thing down the road. But before we get into the university, before we finish uh, this brief survey of what it means to be a monk, let me kind of give a little uh, detail about the way the monks taught. Right? If they're focused on copying manuscripts in the early days, then they focus on preaching and teaching. How do they teach their own? How do, how do they care for their own? What, what does it mean to go into a monastic education? Well, they tend to be country. They tend to be rural folks. They tended to, to be connected, especially in the early days, with a building, with a monastery. You wanted to go out. You wanted to be around monks like you. They tended to be experts in church law, canon law, not civil law. Right? They tended to be training folks for the church. They were quiet. They were orderly. But here's the issue. The problem you have is that that's great for monks. But what about the ordinary pastor? Where are they getting trained? There's no seminary. There's no, there's no real place for them to go. How are they going to get trained? You begin to have, in maybe the 9th, 10th, 11th century, you begin to have a lot of bishops looking at their priests and saying, wow, these guys don't know their Latin that well. They're mumbling through Mass. They don't really know enough of the Bible. And the people are not learning anything about Jesus. That's a huge problem. And so uh, roughly around the same time as you have these guys emerging, these years, 1100s, 1200s, you began to have the emergence of Secular and cathedral schools. Now, of course, Charlemagne, early on, had a secular school. That is a royal court school. You have a tutor there. But by the 1200s, you have cathedral schools growing up. What's a cathedral? Well, a cathedral is a huge church building. That's what we know. Why is it called a cathedral? It's called a cathedral because every, <coughs> every cathedral has to have a cathedra. A cathedra meaning a chair of the bishop, where the bishop sits in office and power. And so a cathedral school is where the bishop starts to educate his local priest. The bishops begin to say, look, we're the guys in charge, but our, our, our priests aren't that great. They need to learn more. <clears throat> and so you begin to have, for example, at, at Notre Dame in Paris, these kind of religious communities, these cathedral schools. And slowly and surely, they begin to develop into the university. Before we hit that, let me pause for any questions, comments, elaboration I can give. Going once, going twice. All right. We come to teaching, university, Christian education, a topic that we're, this is a Christian education class in a sense, so in some ways we're, we're the heirs of the, uh, the medieval university in a sense, but not really, because <clears throat> the, the goal of, the, of, of Christian education 
in the Middle Ages was summed up by the famous statement, I have it on your outline, famous statement of Anselm, I believe in order to understand. I believe in order that I might understand, or as the Latin goes, uh, fides quarent intellectum, faith seeking understanding. Not understanding seeking faith. This is a, a huge debate in the Middle Ages, a huge debate today. What comes first, our brains or our souls? What comes first, our faith or our reason? And for the Christians, one of the reasons why the Middle Ages are not the Dark Ages, but the Light Ages, the Ages of Enlightenment, really. One of the reasons why the Middle Ages are very uh, scientifically engaged is that they believed that God created the world. And they took that seriously. They wanted to learn everything they could about every square inch of the universe that they found themselves in. They wanted to learn it all because they believed in a God who made it all. I think if there's one point that should make you want to learn more, it's that point right there. If there's one point that should inculcate in us a love of learning, it should be that point right there. Right? God, God made it all, therefore we should seek to understand all that we can. Seek to understand all that we can. Um, now, we come to the way and the emergence of universities. You have universities starting to pop up by the year 1100. By the year 1200, you have universities in Paris, you have universities in Oxford. Most of the great European universities today were founded in the Middle Ages. That should tell you something about what and why uh, they were significant. You have the development here of <coughs> universities. By 1500, there are about 80 in Western Europe. Each of them focus on different topics. Paris is great for theology. You go to Oxford if you want science and math. Uh, Bologna, Bologna in Italy for law. Each university would have four different Departments, you might say. Law, medicine, theology, and the arts. Law, medicine, theology, and the arts. It's interesting that they had all four of these together. It's very different, for example, than the other competitor in the, in the, in the days, Muslim universities. In Islam, they would have separate universities for each each area. You wouldn't go to one, one place and get all the education. You go here for law. You go to Baghdad for uh, medicine or science. You go to Damascus for uh, theology. But in the Western world, because they, they viewed the whole world as made by God and, and therefore in, alive under God, they combined it all. That's why it's called a university, by the way. It's called a university because professors came from all over the universe to join the educational enterprise. That's where we get the word university from. <clears throat> now, what, what, what did it mean to have to go to school in university? Well, first of all, they didn't have dorms. You had to rent a room, usually in a tavern, second floor, third, third floor of a tavern. Maybe with somebody, if you know, if you have family in, in the area. <clears throat> There, there are no dorms. The classrooms aren't all in one spot. There's no university campus. You go over here in Paris and over there in Paris, and you go to the different areas. You have different places. Uh, you would enter university if you're about 14 or 15 and a guy, right, 14 or 15. All you need is a little education in Latin and the ability to pay. Latin is the only language spoken. It was the universal language. It was the proper language of culture and civilization. And therefore, uh, there were no national language barriers. You didn't have to know French. You didn't have to know English. You could just know Latin. Uh, but the student body was divided up according to where you were from. All the French together, all the Italians together, all the English together. That was the, that was the lifestyle. And each student body had its own rules, its own regulations. Uh, each student kind of nationality was headed over by a proctor. And the proctors together elected a rector who was the head of the university. Each faculty, each of these four, had a dean, dean of law, dean of theology. All the lecturers, and this is significant, all the lecturers, not just the theology lecturers, all of them 
were clergy. They were all priests. They were all priests or monks. All students had to be unmarried. You couldn't get married when you're at school. The academic year was longer than our year, 11 months. A few weeks off for Christmas, a couple weeks for Easter. That's about it. So you go to school. If you think it's bad, you know, now it was worse back then. How did they learn? How did they learn? They learned in two ways. The way they taught, basically, was in two different types. You went to class, and uh, somebody would write down the, the, the lecture. They'd take notes. We actually have uh, recorded uh, notes. There was official kind of secretary. Often the, the, the lecturer, the professor, would call on somebody who could take notes well and say, you, you be the, the note taker. And we, have, we have some of those uh, extant today. But you had two ways of learning. You had the lecture and you had the disputation. And it's important to realize that we're no longer in the monastic area. The monks were known when they taught for being very contemplative. They would erupt into prayers. They'd, they'd suddenly break out into song in their teaching times. At the university, you didn't have any of that. Maybe the, 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 the lecturer would perhaps uh, open up with uh, a prayer, but this was school. This was education. Doesn't mean that they didn't love the Lord. It just meant we want to understand more about who God is and what he does. You can pray, you can sing after class. They understood the, the difference here because they, they want to think seriously about God's truth. They want to understand his world. So the lecture. In the lecture, uh, the teacher would read out a text to the students. I have a copy of uh, part of Peter Lombard's sentences. That was the, the classic text in the Middle Ages, the textbook they had. Peter the Lombard, known as the uh, Sentences. And what that was, basically, was a collection of quotes from the early church fathers, or quotes from earlier theologians, and comments on them. Now, the monks had had something like this. They had what they called, I don't want to overload you, had what they called the Florilegia, which were basically just quoting early church fathers. Bunch of quotes, bunch of little passages put together. You know, I put a, a large quote in the back, sometimes I have smaller quotes. That would be a Florilegium. You know, it would be trying to understand what have Christians thought about X? What have Christians thought about the cross? What have they thought about the incarnation? What have they thought about uh, the, the Ten Commandments? What have they said was required in the Sixth Commandment? Well, here's what Augustine said. Here's what uh, John Damascus said. Quote, quote, quote. Maybe they make sense together. Maybe they don't make sense together. That began to be a huge problem. One of the reasons why the university is formed is the fact that, that not every early Christian agreed. Sometimes Augustine said one thing about faith and justification, and sometimes Pilate said another thing. Sometimes one person in the East, John of Mass, said one thing about icons. And then, as we saw last time, Theodolf in Charlemagne's period said a different thing. How, how do you harmonize the contradiction? That's what Lombard does. In the Middle Ages, you begin to have the emergence of these sentence commentaries where they would quote both sides or quote multiple theologians and say, okay, how do we get this together? How do we harmonize this? What really is the truth behind it? And so that was the lecture style. Uh, if you were a student, you were supposed to take notes, very full notes on everything. You didn't have books, so not everybody had their own textbook. In fact, probably the university only had one or two copies of Lombard sentences. They were very precious, so you had to take notes on whatever paper you had. That was a lecture. That's kind of like what we do here a little bit. The second thing, and maybe the more interesting thing, was a disputation. This is the fun thing. This is a debate. A public event in which a teacher and a student would set out to solve a problem. So the way it would work, I'll be, I'll be the teacher in this scenario because I'm, I'm right here, right? That makes sense. Uh, and and you call on somebody like Philip. You say, Philip, <clears throat> give me five reasons why God exists. And Philip would stand up and give us, I'm gonna, no requirements. Uh, <clears throat> he would stand up and he would give five reasons why God exists. Then he'd call on somebody else, right? He'd call on Bob. He'd say, Bob, give me two objections to those reasons. 
why God does not exist, right? You set up the problem. You say, why does God exist? Prove it. All right, other side. Why does God not exist? Prove it. Or you'd have a more Christian example, right? So, for example, you'd quote our early church father saying, God cannot die. You'd quote somebody else, a different church father saying, God died on the cross. And you give the quotes for, you give the quote against, you give the Bible passages for, Bible passages against, the great theologians for. You'd offer your own comments, maybe at the very end. Very rarely you'd offer your own comments. And then the teacher would give the conclusion. He would solve the problem. So he would say, well, both statements are true, if interpreted properly. In his divine nature, God cannot die, for example. But when he became a man, he took on human nature, which can die. So on the cross, God suffered death according to his human nature. But he remains incapable of dying in his divine nature. That's one summary. It's just powerful to teach logic. It's powerful to teach thinking. It's powerful to teach what it is to know the truth and to know why you believe the truth. Now, this wasn't just for students. Oftentimes, if you were a smart, you know, teacher, you'd ha- work on your own projects, like professors do today. You have your own thoughts. And maybe after you get those thoughts together, you'd set them up in what were called theses. You'd write them down. You'd post them on the bulletin board in the university area. And you would say, look, anybody want to debate me on this topic? I'll be here in a week or two. Of course, this is what Luther did, very famously. 95 Theses on repentance, on the Pope, indulgences. So, as a student, when you finish your course, you'd be a bachelor. It takes about five years, six years, so 14 to 20, 14 to 19. To obtain the higher degree of master or doctor, master allowed you to teach in this school, doctor allowed you to teach at most universities. It took much longer. 14 years of study were necessary to become a doctor of theology. And universities grew over and over and over again. They grew, they, they blossomed, they mushroomed. That's both good and bad. As we'll see, the universities grew, and that means learning grew. But Unlike the monasteries, you don't take the vows. You take the vow to chastity, but not to poverty. There's no abbot that you take a vow to obedience to. You're not isolated from the world. You're in Paris. You're in London. You're around everything. You have this freedom to engage in rich, deep intellectual debates. And that means maybe you won't always agree with Augustine. Maybe you won't always agree with the church of old. You begin to have folks who... Uh, begin to push the bounds of what is theology? What, what is right and proper theology? And in some ways, that's good if the church needs to reform itself. But as we'll see other, other times, there can be a great challenge. Uh, I give you an example in the back here. This is um, Thomas Aquinas on predestination. This is the way he would kind of famously set out his question. This is the way he would have a disputation. He would begin with a question. In this case, is God's foreknowledge of good works, the cause of predestination. He gives objections. Then he has, on the other hand, then he gives response. He responds to the objections. And if you read through it, not right now, of course it's long, it's, it's in, in, you know, high level. But if you read through it, you find that Aquinas' view on predestination is actually uh, very similar to ours. But more on that maybe next week. So I think that's enough for today. I have more, of course, I can go into. Um, but I think that's sufficient for the, for the day on, too. Any, uh, any questions on any of that? Anything you want to follow up on? Just a flavor. Just a flavor. Yes, sir. What was the, the ratio of pastor priest versus monastic? Uh, or were there any monastic priests? Yeah. Are those distinct roles? Yes and no. I hate to give you that kind of answer, but um, it depends where you are and depends what kind of order you are. Um, Generally, monks would be separate from priests. And yet, as we saw with the Dominicans, right, the monks are able, the, the Pope says, look, I give you special privilege, Dominican monks, you can go and you could preach, teach, administer the sacraments, to anybody who comes, go out in the country and do it. Um, yeah, so it, it really depended 
Sometimes, sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. Uh, you know, if, if you're in, in the early Middle Ages, you're with Benedict in Italy somewhere, you know, you're, you're going to be a monk more. You're going to focus much more on that uh, than on any, any priestly status. Yeah, good question, though. Other questions? Oh, I feel like they're Benedictine. I don't know. I, I should know that. Yeah, um, I should know that. I've been to Benedictine Monastery before. It's interesting. Um, I just knew a fellow that was a priest in Florida where I lived. He got out of line and he ended up over Conyers in restitution of some kind. <laughs> sure. Well, and that's... You know, the reality is that these, these monasteries become big institutions. And that's why I call them, they're, they're almost denominations within their own. And you might think of them that way. Uh, and of course, today we have all, I mean, there's, there's thousands of, of, of monastic orders of all sorts. I haven't even gotten into the nuns, right? That'd be a, a later time. Okay. Mm, that's a big, great question. Um, Simple answer, of course. Uh, some some changed, some didn't. I mean, so you think of um, <clears throat> Oxford, Cambridge. Let's just take England. I suppose that easy, easy example there. Um, they they begin to get uh, less and less connected to the church. They begin to have less and less oversight from the church. They begin to be more and more free in their study of uh, of, of of science, of the arts, of, of medicine. And of law, uh, you know, you know, maybe you know the statement, uh, Ted. Right, theology was the queen of the sciences. Right, so this order is kind of wrong. In the Middle Ages, you have theology up here, and other things kind of down below. That gets reversed. That gets kind of not reversed, but they become equal in a manner of speaking, uh, in, 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 as the Reformation goes along. Um, but in different by country and place. Yeah, maybe a great answer for you. But other questions? Good questions. We have time. Not all the time, but we have some time. Greg, you always have a good question. No good question. I must have failed today then. There's no good question from Greg. Uh, yes, sir. You may. So what happened? The uh, seminaries we have now, how are they different than the universities? <clears throat> well, so you think about Princeton, for example. Right, you have Princeton University. You have Princeton Seminary. You have Yale University. You have Yale Divinity School Seminary, I ask. Um, they're different in that uh, I didn't take any vows when I went to seminary, right? Um, and in the university, there was at least the vow to chastity, right, that they had to take there. Uh, they're also different in that um, at seminary, we didn't learn law, we didn't learn medicine. Uh, thankfully, probably in my case, uh, we learned some of the arts as they relate to theology. But um, I guess the, the, the closest parallel we have to universities today would be kind of the general liberal arts uh, education. Um, yeah, that may not be answering your question. You might want to compare them, I suppose, to the, um, the theology schools, right? The closest parallel you might have to a seminary would be a, 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 the theology portion of, of a degree. Um, you know, the other thing, as I would say, is that many seminaries struggle with connecting the student to a local church. And that's a, one of the great, one of the critiques of the universities and a lot of, of, of much of literature is these are just academic nerds. Uh, these are just scholars who talk and talk and talk and they, they, they think, but they don't really live the Christian life. That's why you have a lot of the monks come out and they say, no, the Franciscans say, no, no, we got we to gotta live the Christian life. Um, we got to go out in the world. Um, but the thing is, uh, the university was only a method to learning. At its best, the medieval university was a method to learn God's truth. And I suppose a seminary would be equivalent to that today. That may not have answered all your questions, but yeah. Sure. Have left the monastery because I know, like, you read about the nuns, and like, <coughs> you were taught in a nunnery, but then you had the choice to become a nun and where to go. Yeah, so I mean, if, if you are taught and, and you decide, hey, this, this isn't life for me, you certainly could go. I mean, if you if you break your vows, there are plenty of stories 
uh, later on, I'll tell you that story next time, probably next time I think of uh, Abelard and H H Heloise, their famous love story, Middle Ages. Uh, it involves uh, a monk uh, kind of breaking his vows in a pretty intense way. Um, so you can do it in the bad way. Um, and if you did, if you went through kind of monk training, if you will, you decided it's not for me, you could leave before you took the vows. But after taking the vows, uh, rare, yeah, rare occasions. I mean, yeah. You could find an exception to that, but usually pretty stuck. Alexis, yes. At Aspen University, did they go on to curriculum? Was it just for the point of learning? What did they do after the university? Yeah, so often they could become a lawyer, they could become a doctor, you know, in medicine. Um, not quite as prestigious as it is today. They could, of course, become uh, uh, trained in, in kind of um, – elite circles and go and live at court or go and be an often you have noble folks who go there and they go back to their land and they become a they they're a lord they, they become a lord you know uh other times maybe they, they're really intellectual and they want to become a um a teacher they will become a master or a doctor and often that's what you have kind of the self-perpetuating of the university yeah so it's really depending on what you're there for you can go a variety of, of, of places um all right i think that's a great question glad you have me give me more uh, yes, Jim. Yeah, that'll come uh, maybe more in the uh, the modern age <laughs> in a couple of years, uh, maybe in the in the um, Reformation Enlightenment period. Yeah, yeah some changes there. Um, but um, let me let me, uh, Jim. Since you asked the last question, let me ask you to pray if that's okay. <laughs> Giving us minds, giving us the truth, we would be guided, and we desire to have it, and so use it to serve.